Hello and welcome to the WIHS Journal of Public Affairs from 104.9 FM. I'm Paul Kretschmer. We're going to be talking with a man who is in charge of the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. His name is Keir Thalander, and he'll be talking to us about training of surgeons in Africa. Sure, absolutely. So the, yeah, the article was about uh, women being the solution to the surgical crisis, specifically in Africa. And yet the points that they made uh, were more related to the difficulties of women being treated poorly or having a different status within the culture is not really even related to surgery. But there's a number of things that uh, could be said that they do highlight some issues that are there. Uh, From a faith perspective, they really have left out anything with regards to faith in the way that the article is written in addressing this problem, which I think is a major issue. If you don't have a faith backbone or a background for doing these things, then they certainly aren't going to be lasting. So that's that's one thing that kind of caught my eye, if you will, or caught my uh, yeah caught my eye as I was looking at the article. The other aspects are that it's 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 more than just a problem of of women in surgery. There's just not enough surgeons overall, and a lot of that has to do with the opportunity for throughput through a university system that really is very very different than what we do here in the U.S. And so applying U.S. kind of approaches doesn't really work um, if if you're going to work within the system that's already there. Could you draw the distinction between the way things are approached here in the States as opposed to perhaps in Africa, as you just briefly touched on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a couple of ways. Those who are familiar with medical training here in the United States, and particularly for physicians, would know what the American College of Graduate Medical Education is. And as we know, those of us who are involved in that, that is not related to the Ministry of Education in this country. It is actually a self-governing college which allows uh, the American Board of Surgery, specific to surgeons now, the American Board of Surgery is actually the controlling body of who certifies a surgeon. And all the hospitals within this country recognize that if you're an American Board Certified Surgeon, then you would be allowed privileges at their hospital, um, of course, with, with all the contingencies that would be expected. That's different than what they approach in, in Africa. In fact, different than most of the rest of the world, which is still focused on a university-type approach. And essentially what that means in terms of differentiating the, the two systems, when I was a resident, uh, I was working for a hospital. And yes, I received a, a certificate of competence at the end of that and sat for my boards with the American Board of Surgery. But if you're in most places in Africa, you're in a university and you are considered a graduate, me- a graduate student where you're still paying tuition. Uh, sometimes you may have a, a, a stipend that is related to something from the government or some sort of uh, grant that allows that tuition to be covered. You may not pay out of pocket, but often you do have to pay out of pocket, which makes it prohibitive for people to go into these kinds of training. And then at the end of that, you receive a, a degree rather than a certificate of competence with a focus more on the university professorial pathway than it is on the clinical pathway, which is what we are here in the United States, very focused on clinical training as a, a postgraduate. So after medical school, um, the, the residency training is fo- focused on clinical aspects rather than on the university kind of professorial academic side of medicine. As far as this um, shortage of, of surgeons within the continent of Africa, what do you, where do you think that comes from as far as the, the number that are graduating and going one place or another? Do many of them come over here to the States and, and ha- try to work, its, work their way into the American system by going through additional training that meets the criteria that we have here in North America rather than staying in Africa or or choosing to do something else that's, that's not directly related to patient care? Yeah, so that's actually a very valid issue. There's a number of, of people that come through the medical systems in Africa or the university systems, as I should put it, the university systems that may get a medical degree through a university system that would then go into politics. Uh, politics tends to be a bit more lucrative in a number of places in Africa, and so they'll go into politics, or they may go into other, uh, other aspects or other disciplines in life Doing surgery in some places is very difficult. There's a lot of supplies that are needed for that. Although they are reusable, there's an initial investment of startup to be to be functioning as a surgeon. There are some people in the brain drain that we talk about that have that go to Europe or that may go to the United States 
usually it's a, at an earlier stage. They'll often go to the United States at a stage before medical school. Um, someone who's gone through medical school and then has gone through a postgraduate training, a university training in a, in a, a master's program to become a surgeon, as they would call it in most places in Africa, may not choose to give that up to come to the United States to try to do surgery here. They would have to start really almost at square one, do a residency all over again. So we're not seeing a lot of that, but there's a little easier pathway to places in Europe. So there may be a bit more of a brain drain into Europe. And then the, there's an internal brain drain where concentrations of surgeons are certainly in the big cities. Uh, you can take the country of Burundi, for example, where uh, just a few years ago, they had 20 surgeons for 11 million people. All of them were in the capital city. Not one were in a remote area. And you had less than half of the population in the capital city. Why was that? Because surgeons expected to be compensated and or have a lifestyle within a major urban area such as it is, rather than serving out in the area where it, they would be away from those kind of comforts or, or, or uh, perks that, that they would like to have because they have gone through the university process and are certified as a surgeon and therefore don't feel that they are, that, that a rural area is worthy of their status or of their perceived skill level? Yeah, that's absolutely a portion of it. There's some people that would, that would be their issue. Uh, there's other people that may try it and they just don't have all the, the aspects that are needed to have the drive to start a surgery program in a place that has never had surgery at a hospital that may be a district hospital that maybe would do a C-section, maybe, but doesn't have instruments. That takes a lot of courage to go to a place like that. And so it's not just people who are always looking for money or looking for an easier life or status. That is true. That is sometimes the case. There's also a real realism and a real realistic uh, aspect of that where it's just difficult to do, and sometimes you just cannot accomplish that. There's a number of hospitals where our, even our graduates within our program called PAX, Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, where they may end up at a hospital where the hospital does not have a functional operating room. You can't function as a surgeon without an operating room. You just can't. And so there's, there's that aspect as well. The infrastructure is not there in the, in the level that we would expect it to be there for someone to, to be functioning as a surgeon in those environments. I'd like to circle around to a point you made a moment ago before we move on to some, some specifics about the uh, organization that, that you are the chief medical officer of. And that is, I've noticed over the years, w listening to the news from various outlets from Africa, inc including correspondents from the BBC or in the old days from South Africa, for instance, noticed that a lot of the politicians did, in fact, have an, an MD after their name. I was wondering if that is kind of a, kind of a thing that... that gives them the kind of shine before the public that, that encourages people to vote for them if they do dis to decide to go into the political or other line of work in that part of the world. Absolutely. Doctors are still quite well respected in most of Africa. Um, you can maybe take it as what it was like in the U.S. about 50 years ago when mm -hmm. there was almost a reverence for physicians. Yeah. Um, that's not the case anymore, and it's probably a bit too extreme. Uh, but that is still what you see in a lot of Africa. It's a don't don't ask questions. He's a doctor. She's a doctor. You can't question what they say. That doesn't mean everybody does what the doctor says. It just means they won't question them in public. And as a result, you're right. They can go into politics, and people see them as someone who's capable and is has a high level of training and should not be questioned. And so they they will they will go with what they say. I'd like to turn the corner now. I see that you are identified as the Chief Medical Officer of the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. Could you tell me how long that organization has been in place, and what was the initial instigation for creating it and, and becoming active as you are now? Yeah, so PACS, the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, was uh, started because of a recognition of the lack of surgeons in mission hospitals, on two levels. One was the, the present lack, so that was in the late 1990s, 1997, when the first residence started, and the lack of surgeons at that time, but also the recognition that going forward, the missionary surgeons that were really supporting, because surgery is a, an income bring, brings receipts into the hospital, those missionary surgeons were retiring, and who would replace them? So it was really a, a twofold aspect. Care Thalander is with the Pan African Academy of Christian Surgeons. We'll hear more on tomorrow's broadcast. For further information, call 860 346 1049. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kretschmer on the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from WIHS Middletown.